Sharana, it's really good to have you here with me today. I'm so excited to get to chat with you about some of your journey over the last, I guess it's been like three years, perhaps. And, you know, before you came to Bones for Life, um, can you tell us a little bit about what your life was like? Oh, um, well, I had been retired a while. So I had, um, after I retired um, from being a social worker, I then decided I needed to focus more on myself. Um, and um, I wanted to feel better. And so then I went on, I, I discovered about that time that I had scoliosis, which was maybe um, eight years ago. Um, the doctors had known it earlier, but I did not find out till later. So I went on a mission to help my scoliosis. My first primary doctor, I told him I had poor posture. He said, you don't have poor posture. He hadn't even looked at me, you know, that whole thing. You know, he just so that I, anyway, I went to the ortho, orthopedic then on my own. And um, she sent me to a PT. Um, and she says, I can't help you because I didn't need surgery. It wasn't that bad then. And um, so the PT did yoga, my favorite thing. I thought, oh, wow, this is really good. And he says, you're really good at yoga. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is a good match. But then um, I was trying to help my uh, alignment, my posture. I wasn't quite as aware that was as bad then as I got to know later. And so after the uh, yoga class with the first PT, I realized I wasn't where I needed to be. And that actually I'd done some postures and asanas, whatever, that weren't really the best for me to do. So then... I was on this mission, as I said again, to find out about myself physically, because I kind of put it on the back burner when I was working, helping other people, taking care of kids, my grandma, dog, all that stuff, which was very important to me. And I'm glad I, that was my focus then. Um, and so somewhere in there, I started jumping on a trampoline, you know, because of cardio. Oh, wow, this is great. And um, then I found out uh, I had scoliosis um, on that part. So that's why I then stopped doing the trampoline because it depressed, de it um, compressed me. That's what the orthopedic told me. And so I said, yeah, that makes sense. So then the orthopedic took uh, me on to see another uh, PT and they didn't know much um, or anything really about um, scoliosis and alignment. Um, I looked online and none of them specialized in that. So that was really frustrating to me. And then as my mission continued on my journey, um, I saw a yoga um, teacher that specialized in scoliosis for yoga. And she was really kind of, she was, she was helpful. And um, so I liked her, we connected. I have a whole big book of different photos she took of me. And, but then that cost a little bit of money, private. So then I went to see somebody, a PT, um, my insurance would pay. And so he's decided to do the scroth. How does never quite pronounce it right? The scroth method for scoliosis. Um, for, are you familiar with that, Cynthia? I am. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And so he said, yeah, you're a good candidate for that. And so I committed to myself for a year for doing that. My husband's sitting up kind of late at night. He said, wow, you're really dedicated to that. I said, yeah. At first, I didn't like it because it was very different. It, yeah. um, the breathing felt really odd to me and uh, the movement. But then I just, the more I did it, the more I became used to it. And so, as I said, I committed that myself to that scrap for a year with a PT. And it didn't help me. It was kind of fun doing it because I made it that way. But um, that was about all I did for that year because that's all I really had time for. With, I was doing an hour or so a day. And then I had an x-ray and it hadn't improved any. And I know it wasn't going to improve much with my scoliosis, but it had gotten a little worse. And um, I at least had expected it to stabilize with the scoliosis x-ray. And it did not. Um, it got, like I said, worse. And I asked him why. And, well, he said, well, if it hadn't been for the scroth method, it could have gotten even worse. Well, true. <laughs> and um, so then... And it was also difficult because two PTs disagreed about the way I should breathe with the scroff method. 
And then, so then my scoliosis continued getting worse. And I contacted the National Scoliosis Foundation. And they said, wow, it really has gotten worse over a period of time from when I first, it was like 30 something, and then it was like in the 40s. And then that's when he confirmed it was probably because of the trap jumping on the trampoline, which I'd already stopped. So then, okay, I went back to that same PT a few times, another PT, and they were good. You know, I have, like to have faith in my teachers, except the one that just did yoga at the very beginning. Um, so then I decided, well, I want to look elsewhere. And um, how did I first run across? Well, let me just ask you a question about that, Sharana. So, yeah. so scoliosis is a diagnosis that didn't bother you for a long time. So was it bothering you? Or what, what, what was it that made you feel like you needed to work with it? Um, my poor posture. So it just felt like your posture was not good. And it was yeah, my, continuing to go in a direction of not good. Yeah, I didn't have pain then. You did not have any pain then. Okay. Mm -hmm. My husband noticed it. And I just said, it's because I don't sleep much. I work so much. And um, yeah, it was the poor posture that first okay. Got upset it. me Got it. about that. Yeah. So then I think you came to, you, you saw about process maybe on Facebook and you came to uh, one of the three part lives that we offer. Uh, oh, yeah. Bones for life. Mm -hmm. Bones and for life. Talking about so your that. number one. Yeah. So you, so when you came to bones for life, your number one goal was to improve your posture. Yeah. I've been to Feldenkrais before that. And um, then from somebody there, I heard about bones for life. They said they really loved it. And I said, okay, I'll try it. And then uh, <laughs> I didn't know too much about it. Um, so yeah, that was 2022. Um, I heard the intro and it sounded very appropriate, interesting, fun, different. I'm stimulated by different things. And um, I didn't really think it's, nothing's gonna help scoliosis. It's my back, my back had started hurting then from the scoliosis. So that's what motivated me more as well as the poor posture. And it sounded really interesting, different, never heard of anything like Bones for Life before, even though I'd been in Feldenkrais some, this was something I saw with different eyes or lens and it posture. And uh, so I heard the three introductory sessions as I've heard ever since um, 2022, they're all always interesting to me. But anyway, the introductory sessions told me or spoke to me that this is something that might help you. I said, okay. Um, and um, I guess I didn't hesitate too much about signing up because um, something inside of me just said this could possibly help. So then I did, um, of course. And that was, I had some ups and downs with that because I'm with myself, I wasn't sure how much I wanted to commit myself. I was feeling discouraged with myself too because of everything I'd been through. But overall, Bones for Life was a very empowering process for me. Um, my walk- I remember, I remember how hungry you were. I, but that's what I remember. I remember how hungry you were for more information, more help. You were very, very hungry. Yeah. Very hungry, yes. Yes. And, yeah, questions, inquiry. I really yeah. like to ask questions. And um, Brian, I took the immersions one, two, and three with Brian. And he really encouraged the inquiry, which I love the questions. Um, I like to quote Einstein sometimes because he's very big into questions. And I have a whole sheet here, but I won't share that with Einstein's <laughs> emphasis on the importance of questions and curiosity. That's uh, right. That's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Curiosity is the way that we really get a new path forward. Otherwise, we just repeat the same thing over and over again, don't we? Or what's the characteristics of how life feels like it's unfolding for you now? I have a book called The Art of Noticing by um, Rob Walker. And I was thinking, oh, well, that fits really well in with what I love with Bones for Life. You know, you just go out in the world and notice different things. And yeah, Bones for Life has increased my noticing of my body and the world around me, which I had no idea I, that would happen. Um, it's one of the habits I listed under um, the nine habits of um, Bones for Life is to increase, well, obviously my awareness, but just noticing around me to be paused and take more time 
um, to see and appreciate the world around me. Did I you want to read me those nine habits? I'm non-judgmental, curiosity, wonder, possibilities, acceptance, um, sensing self, self-inquiry, simplicity, and self-care. The nine habits of bones for life, the way I uh, feel about it. And then I had six S's of bones for life. Uh, surprise, uh, sensing self, self-inquiry, simplify, self-awareness, and self-care. And I do want to say about surprise. Um, I first learned about surprise with soul collage that was emphasized when we read these cards. And But when we have these aha moments and uh, bones for life, when something just whatever feels good for us or different, uh, it's like a surprise. And that novelty, as you know, that it is, um, encourages us and motivates us. And our brain likes that novelty, the surprise, the ha-ha moment. And I, that is a big part for me. I, I don't know. It's just, it's fun. I guess that's yes. it. I mentioned to you one email, oh, that Bones for Life is a hobby. Well, I never thought about it like that before. But a hobby is something we love to do, right? And we look forward to doing it. And that's the way I look forward to Bones for Life. The class and the way I do it outside of class, that it's just an ongoing hobby. I, I grow with Bones for Life. How much time now that you've done it, how much time, do you, do you have a sense like how much time a week you spend on it or is it just something that just you do now? You do. Um, Usually a, a week or, um, well, I mean, Bones for Life, I think about it when I walk, when I um, do my upper body, but as far as actually doing maybe an hour, not an hour, maybe 45 minutes a day doing something with Bones for Life, um, as far as a process. Um, yeah. So I go through times, but right now I'm doing a little bit more Feldenkrais because I'm taking it from a teacher. But um, my mind, I think that's ultimately what is important. My mind is all these having this inquiry about how I can, I know it comes back to posture, but that is so important for me, for alignment, to feel comfortable. Um, and I feel that is, it becomes part of my everyday life and thinking and feeling bones for life. And the process is nice, but I like what happens outside of just doing only the processes. Beautiful. So and, it sounds it sounds like you just feel the carryover in so many other areas of your life. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everywhere and anywhere. I feel it's really, and it's something I can grasp onto with the 90 processes. Again, that it might be sounds like a lot, but at least there are 90 and you know, as compared with Feldenkrais, it goes on and on, which it has its benefits, of course. And then also, I like the, Brian first said it, that the 90, the 90, there's really one way into the 90 processes. They're all, how does he say that? They're all the same. Um, kind of all the same lesson. They're all pointing towards one great big giant lesson. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. So whatever I do, I know it's going to help my whole body. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So, you had a moment with your physical therapist when uh, you I think it's your current physical therapist, but maybe not when they told you that they thought something about you would have, you maybe would have had to have surgery if you weren't oh. doing this for life. So you got some very, yeah. Can you tell us about that? And they said, yeah, I'm keep active. And that's really important because my curve at being at 44 degrees is really severe. If I wasn't active that I would probably have to have surgery. And when I saw my, um, PT, um, she hadn't seen me for two years. And um, this was within the last six months. When she saw me this two years later, she said, you're the same as you were last time, <laughs> which was a compliment, meaning for my age, you know, you, I hadn't got any worse. I was still as act looked as well as I did two years ago to her. It's true. I mean, as we age, things tend to fold in on us more, don't they? We collapse down, they fold in on us more. So sometimes we're not looking for some enormous reversal of what's there, but this ability to maintain ourselves without 
so much of a struggle. And I, I hear from you that that's, this has been very life giving for you as, and not like a huge, enormous struggle, but instead you've been able to maintain while having less back pain, while having more confidence, while navigating all the challenges around uh, the personal challenges are within your, your family unit. Uh, that's a phenomenal, that's a phenomenal outcome. It is. Yeah. If I stop, especially when I stop to think about it, when you're in the middle of something, sometimes you don't think about it, but you're right. What you just said that, yeah, it's exactly compared to what I was before bones for life. What advice would you have for someone that is thinking about doing bones for life? If they were, especially if they were in the same situation, maybe they're uh, around your age, they feel like they have poor posture, maybe even they have a severe curb and scoliosis. What advice would you want to offer to someone that's in that same situation before they really jump into bones for life? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, you definitely want to take the time to find out about it. Um, and so you become more motivated that way and um, ask other people, ask yourself, um, and definitely attend the three introductory classes. Bones for Life, it just makes me feel better physically and mentally. And I feel I look more attractive. Like you said, I'd already all scrunched over. <laughs> and um, so I said, would just say, try the first immersion. You don't have to commit yourself to all three. I didn't think I was going to do all three, but I'm really, really, really glad I did. And... Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just mm -hmm. a heartwarming process with the great teachers. Um, yeah. Well, it's been beautiful uh, getting a relationship with you over time, Sharana. It's uh, and to watch your journey, even though I wasn't your teacher, you know, I wasn't your teacher. Yeah. Lots of conversations uh, in Facebook and by email and uh, mm -hmm. your enthusiasm for life has been very inspiring and keeps us remembering uh, the importance of what we do, which is so, so it's so valuable uh, to have people like you. So it helps us to remember, oh yeah, what we do is important, it matters. And uh, we love your smile. And uh, anytime we see you, anytime I see your name, I'm excited to oh, see you. Oh, well, thank you. And I can't thank you and Brian and the other teachers and your other staff that work behind the scenes enough. Um, yeah, that just makes me, that what you said makes me feel good. I appreciate that. And I just hope that others um, just give it a try. Um, sometimes it's frustrating. I tell my family and friends about it. And they just, I don't know. They don't want to try it. I don't know what it's about, but I would say, why not? It really has helped me in so many ways. So I think that often when, we share with our families and friends, it's actually extremely common that they don't follow through on what we recommend. It's a little bit further out mm -hmm. than that, that people listen to us. So, and I think it just comes from like the old adage from the New Testament, Old Testament that says a prophet is never recognized in their own town. Yeah. People that know us really well, I don't know, they just have a tendency to sort of, mm, oh, that's Sharana, oh, that's Cynthia. My experience is that people you talk to in the elevator, the supermarket, oh. people in your neighborhood that don't know you as well, these are the people who listen. And you come on here and people will watch this interview and <laughs> someone will say, I've got scoliosis. I've got that challenge with posture. I want to feel more confident and happier with the way I look. Yeah. I more energy in walking. Mm -hmm. And that will make a really big difference for those people. So try not to be discouraged with that. Mm -hmm. I think that your, your realm of influence <clears throat> is wider than you think, but it's, it's not often right up close. Mm. Uh, you're not yeah. alone in that at all. You're not alone yeah. in that. I see it over and over again. Hmm. Yeah. I even offered to pay for their class and, <laughs> Um, I have other people I'm going to contact about the introductory ones, my church members and so on. Um, so, right. And, and I used to years ago, I, people would call me up family members and want to buy a gift certificate for family members. 
And I, I would often say, I'm not going to take any money unless your family member actually schedules. Uh, it's so common that people close do not follow through. So hmm. when they schedule, I'll call you, I'll take your money. But if I buy you buy a gift certificate, my experience over all these years is that if they didn't ask you for this, they're not going to use it. Mm. And mm. it's it's just people have to have a certain amount of readiness. As a social worker, I bet you discovered a lot about this. Yeah. Over the years, there's a kind of readiness. Mm -hmm. And that readiness to me often looks like a, a, a bit of desperation. Like, mm -hmm. where am I going to get help? I've tried everything. Should I look at something else? Mm -hmm. um, that readiness sometimes looks like, oh, um, this person of authority, my physical therapist, my doctor said it was okay. Therefore, maybe I can try it. But when it's something that's not that the physical therapist or the doctor has said, you really went on a limb when you did this. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you recognize that or not, but you really went out on a limb. You're doing something that's not even yoga. Yoga is known by everybody and yoga gets, right. gets referred to constantly as a solution to things, right? So you went out on a limb when you said, well, I'm going to try this thing that I've never really heard of before. I'm at least going to show up at this three-part life. Somebody said mm -hmm. it might be good, so I'll go try it. Mm -hmm. But it's not like you have a big, there's not like there's a big cultural support for doing it. And some people are okay with going a little bit out on a limb, but the majority of the culture is not. Majority of the culture is like, if it's not been stamped by the official stamps of approval, then mm -hmm. I can't really take a chance on it. So it's a complicated, I think it's complicated when we have something that's so different. And this approach is different yeah it's different isn't it right yeah and you said that when you said I feel felt at the first like what's wrong why aren't they giving me all the answers like I should be told exactly how to do this and how to think about it and how to feel about it what I should notice mm -hmm. and instead this constant redirecting back to you and what is your experience and what are you noticing and what are you think is the answers to that? Mm -hmm. And it's a redefining of who's at the center of the solution. Right. It's us. Yeah. It's you. You get to be at the center of the solution mm -hmm. and you get to become the expert on yourself. Exactly. That's, you know, that's a, that's a good old Virginia Satir show, social it's work. Thing. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, it's like, oh, the person who needs the help gets to be at the center of the constellation of the solution instead mm -hmm. of the doctor, instead of the Bones for Life teacher, instead of the physical therapist. Mm -hmm. and all of these approaches do want people to be in charge of their lives, mm -hmm. but they come out of a model in which there's an authority figure that always knows more than you. Yeah. Exactly. About even yourself. Mm -hmm. It turns out they know even more about you than, than yourself. And, and it's really deeply embedded in our work that people know, even if they don't know, they can know and mm -hmm. they can become an expert on their own bodies and their own experience. Mm -hmm. well, and it doesn't mean that we never need doctors or that we never need physical therapists. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But what a difference in approach, right? It, it fits yeah, right definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't realize that difference so much until I got into the bones for life, like you're saying. And then I learned that I'm my own. There's some quote, you are your own best teacher. And I, I love the way that the, the teachers in bones for life, you and Brian, let us find our own place and the movements, you know, are, are different for each person in the class. You know, like you said, it's, 30 different ways of doing the same um, process. And that's what makes it really interesting. Otherwise, if there was just one right way, oh, I'd get bored. Or, um, but that keeps it very interesting. It does. Yeah, it does. And it, 
And it allows us to begin to trust our own sensation and, and also to question our observations. So it's a combination. I can trust myself, but I can also, I can also question and go, Hmm, is it really true that my right leg is, is mm. heavy on the ground? What all did, how, how could it be heavier on the ground and five minutes later, not be heavier on the ground? How can it change so fast? Right. We begin right. to realize that this this thing that we call human experience is extremely malleable. Yeah, I know. I it's know. It's extremely malleable in such a deep, deep way. It's such a deep. Yeah, it's a deep way. way. That's what I like about Bones for Life. It, you can look at it in a simple way, which it is simple, or you can make it in a deeper and more complex way. Um, and I like that flexibility. You can just go as deep as you want, or just get whatever you want out of it. It's up to the person. So I think that freedom is really beautiful um, to express yourself, to help yourself. And so Brian isn't telling us, yeah, you do it this way. <laughs> um, just He's a very excellent guide. And well, you are too. I just had him. Well, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, but she was certainly your teacher. And it's not that he's not giving you steps to do, but he's saying you can interpret them. You can feel for yourself. <laughs> You can right. go, you can do it even less if it hurts. You mm -hmm. can do it in your imagination and mm -hmm. you come back and do 20% effort, or you can realize your tendency to hit hard and hard and then back off and back off and back off and back off mm -hmm. and realize as you back off, oh, mm -hmm. you sense more, you know more, you are able to better adapt. Right. Is yeah. better able to change. Right. So. I, I think these are incredible characteristics that do make it stand out in this field of people who are trying to work with posture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even in the smaller field of people who are trying to work with scoliosis, which isn't that many, but there's becoming more now. Mm -hmm. And one mm -hmm. of the problems I think for Scroth, it's not that the Scroth method is a bad approach. I don't think mm -hmm. it really is a bad approach but it lacks that capacity to help people stay at the small and let the nervous system help the nervous system unravel those habit patterns mm -hmm. instead of trying to overcome the habit patterns. Mm -hmm. So there's this element in Scroth as is in physical therapy at times of trying to help people overcome the patterns through strengthening, strengthening to overcome the patterns. And I feel like what That's we do, interesting. yeah, I feel like what we do is something very different. We're, oh, what is the pattern? Yeah. Oh, how can we make it safe wow. in your nervous system for the pattern to start to change instead wow. of having a, a battle relationship with it? So again, this kind of goes back to social work. Exactly. Social work, you know, in the systems theory of social work. I mean, we're a systems theory. Social work is a systems theory and the social systems work of social social work system theory. They're, they're looking at not what is wrong and overpowering, but what isn't, isn't as present as it needs to be. What isn't participating in the system where else in the system are there resources that could help this part of the, of the system that's struggling so much, right? Right, the systems approach, yeah, exactly. And meeting the client uh, or patient where they're at in social work. And that's what Bones for Life does. It meets you where you're at, you know? And like you said, of course, the process is we have a manual we can refer to, which is excellent. And with the lessons, um, it just leaves it open for us to work with what we have and then go from there and have that confidence that we can help ourselves and don't have to always have the doctor telling us what to do. And it doesn't work because I was surprised that PTs, like I said, never mentioned posture, didn't have me walk at the time. I didn't think of it. I just thought this is what it is. This is all there is out there until I came to bones for life. And so there is another way. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, I'm so glad you've had the success that you've had with it. And I know you'll continue to explore because that's what you are. You're an explorer. Yeah, I got all my notes. And yeah, actually, this review was helpful for me, too. <laughs> so, um, 
I thank you for um, inviting me to share, Cynthia. I really do appreciate oh, thank the you. opportunity. Thank you, it'll, it'll be so valuable to so many people. I appreciate you too.